So these readings, as you can see, are uh, perfect preparation in the season of Lent for the Passion. Uh, we're preparing for, for Holy Week. Uh, these readings, which are, um, one is a prefiguration of, of the other. Uh, they're, they're, they're setting the scene for this, this, this clash of, we oh, call it a clash of wills, maybe, uh, between scribes and the Pharisees who have their version of religiosity, uh, which is somewhat exterior, it's somewhat, you know, it's performance, uh, it's done in order to be thanked, it's done in order to be considered wise, in order to be considered intelligent, in order to be considered holy, and the Lord who teaches the, the real sense of the law, which is love of God, love of neighbor, interior, love, love. Now, while, again, just because one has love doesn't mean one doesn't need the law, but you can never have so much law that love will be taken for granted. So it's not like if we have more laws, then love will be, will be more protected. Not really, because the law will always be a step behind crime, if you will. You know, uh, like we, we studied this in, in a bit of canon law and civil law. Something only becomes a law after it has been broken, right? So say, for example, uh, like there's a new technology that comes out, like in, the internet didn't exist 40 years ago. So there are all sorts of privacy and GDPR laws and now it didn't exist 30 years ago, 20 years ago, not even five years ago. Uh, so the law, the law changed, the crime, crime is always ahead. And then you know, when these crimes are committed, oh yeah, we make a law against it. And then crime is committed and there's another law against it. So the law is always behind crime, if you will. So how do you, you the law is constantly chasing what people are actually doing. Then when enough people do it, it becomes recognized as, as disadvantageous to, to the individual or to society, then it becomes a law, it becomes forbidden or whatever. Uh, so it's not the law or love, but you, the law can never lead. The law will never be leading, the law is always behind. So in, in the Lord's mind, the law is important. The Lord says so himself. You know, not one dot, not one iota will be taken from the law, even though heaven uh, and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. So these, the law is important, absolutely. But the law on its own, it, it isn't enough because you can exteriorly obey the law and still be full of pride, hatred, jealousy, uh, impurity, all sorts of, 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 of internal sins. So that's why the, the, the primacy is always placed on love, that love supersedes everything, which doesn't mean that, that again, the law isn't important, but love is first, okay? So this is what the, the law is trying to get the, the other way around. Scribes and Pharisees, they knew the law. They lived the law, and they made sure everyone knew that they lived the law. They would tell everyone, you know, I have fasted. Have you fasted? Oh, I'm so hungry because I'm fasting. <laughs> you know, and make sure everyone knew about it, like. So, uh, okay, you've obeyed the law. What do you do? Like, I mean, is that sanctifying your soul? Not really, because you're making sure that everyone thinks you're shock and holy. You know, like, that's, that's vanity. That's not sanctity. That's not renouncing your will in favor of God's. That's telling people, look at me which is vanity. So the Lord is trying to steer things around. And this is going to come to a head uh, in Palm Sunday, welcomed into, the, into Jerusalem. Hosanna, Hosanna, you're the Messiah. And then within seven days, those same people, within, within that Friday, uh, this, that, that same people are shouting, crucify him, crucify him. So uh, it's, 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 a very, it's a tragic scene uh, where we see how, how quickly things change. So just very briefly, in the book of Genesis here, we have the um, account of Joseph being sold. Now, so Joseph is the favorite son. I, I, I particularly dislike that expression. Um, I'm fine with the Bible saying it. Just whenever I hear the word favorite, when it comes to a person, I think it's always going to cause problems. Um, having a favorite son, favorite student, favorite... Uh, if it's a person, you can have a favorite food. But um, a, a favorite person is always going to cause trouble. Uh, so scripture isn't saying that it's okay for parents to have a favorite child but if we think of it in terms of the New Testament uh, Jesus when he comes on earth he is different to the rest of us right so he's uh, the beloved son right this is my beloved son listen to him he's the only one who has kind of sonship in his in his very nature right because he is God from God light from light true God from true God so he's God with a human nature. We're not. So he is different. He is different to us. Uh, so that's okay. It's okay for God to have a, uh, uh, a special place for Jesus in his heart. 
Jesus is God, I'm not. So that's okay. All right. So there's jealousy. But not only jealousy. I mean, it can happen that I see someone who has more than, than I do or is smarter than me or more gifted, whatever it may be. And that can lead to jealousy. Now, uh, rather than seeing them as an example, something I can aspire to, I want to pull them down, right? That's, that's how envy works. So rather than kind of seeing someone who you know, ha has excelled in whatever it be, sport, music, academics, and say, wow, they're so smart, I must study as well. I say, wow, they're so smart, I want to see them fail. That's different, right? So that, that's, that's envy, where you want to pull someone down. So here, rather than, than seeing Joseph, who actually was, as we'll see, uh, as you see later in the story, smart and very virtuous, so he's a good guy, uh, rather than kind of seeing that, you know, seeing his virtue, they want to not just pull him down, but they want to actually kill him, right? So that's, that, that's the level of, of, of hatred that has boiled up within them. So all except Reuben want to actually kill their own brother. Okay, so even though, yes, it, we're not saying it's okay for Jacob to have a favorite son, it should not lead anyone to actually want to kill that son. Right, okay. Now, so Joseph gets sold into slavery and ends up in Egypt. While down there interprets a dream uh, that there'll be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. So because of that, then the Pharaoh builds huge grain stores and the Egyptians are saved, and his brothers end up coming down to him. Because in Canaan as well, uh, there was a famine, so they had to go to where there was food. So they went to Egypt. Bottom line, through this great tragedy of Joseph being sold into slavery, their lives are actually saved. Okay, keep in mind prefigurations here. He sold for what? 20 pieces of silver. Fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus who sold for 30 pieces of silver, and through his death, through this misdeed, through this uh, injustice done to him, our lives are saved. Our souls are saved. See the prefiguration between Joseph and Jesus. So there's an injustice done. And you might say, well, why would God allow this? Like, surely, I mean, if, if Joseph was a, an honorable guy, God should protect him and so on. But in the bigger picture, through his cross and his suffering and being sold into, into slavery, he actually ends up saving the Egyptians and all of his own people. So the cross bears fruit. The cross bears fruit. Jesus then in, in, our, in our gospel today speaks about the vineyard. And it's like, like yesterday. Remember yesterday when we, when we spoke about uh, Lazarus and the rich man, where, where Jesus says those desperately sad words. You know, if they will not listen to Moses or the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone should rise from the dead. Speaking about himself, obviously. I'm going to die, go through all of this, and it will still not be enough for some. Jesus tells this, this parable uh, of the vineyard. Uh, landowner goes, leases it off to tenants, and the tenants are supposed to produce its fruit when the time comes. When the time comes then for the, to collect the produce, the tenants seize the servants, thrash one, kill another, and stone a third. They're the prophets. Right, so the prophets come with this message, repent, return back to God. And what do they do? Kill him. Shoot the messenger, like, shoot the messenger. Don't, don't change your life. Shoot those who call you to more. That's kind of the church today. We call the church's role is we're supposed to live, live as, as saints, best we can, despite our inability, and call society to more. Call society to sanctity. Defend life. Defend authentic justice. Not just social justice as, as it's politically correct these days, but, correct, but defend authentic justice, the right to life of every human being. So we're called to call society to more. So the easiest thing is shoot the messenger and then you don't have to change your life. So shoot, shoot the church, take it down. Uh, but Jesus tells this story knowing that this is, this is what's going to happen to him, right? The landowner sends his son. They will respect my son, says the father. They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw him, they said, this is the heir. Let us kill him and take over his inheritance. Now, again, Jews would have been very attached to the land, they needed to. The land was very, very important to them because this land was given to them by God. So this was like the only place that Jews lived. This was their territory, like. Their world was quite small. Uh, so 
the idea of land, again, it's very, it's very tangible. Like Irish people, we can go abroad and you know, start a family there if you want. Go to Australia, go to America. But for them, like this, this is the Jewish land. You know, this is very, very close to their hearts. So when, when they talk about land, it would resonate particularly with, with them. So then when Jesus asks, and when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Right, so all of the Jews, scribes and Pharisees included, would say, well, they absolutely, they should, you know, we can imagine how, how very clear they would have been that those uh, tenants don't deserve love, that they would deserve justice, that they would deserve imprisonment. I'll bring those wretches to a wretched end. That's probably a nice politically correct uh, translation of what they actually said. Um, but, um, but bottom line is they would deserve punishment. Okay? And Jesus says, I'm actually talking about you guys. I'm talking about you. The kingdom has been entrusted to you, and you're supposed to bear fruit. What's, what's your fruit been? He says the same to priests these days, by the way. You know, this parish, this mission, whatever it was, has been entrusted to you. Where is your fruit? Now, it may be that, that you know, the, the parish is difficult and that the, 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 the ground is hard, uh, but if your fruit is one, two souls, great. There are two or three souls saved for all eternity. Fantastic. If your fruit is an air-conditioned, state-of-the-art parish hall, who cares? Who cares? Souls, eternal life, that's all that matters. Um, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will deliver the produce to him when the season arrives. So Jesus knows he's going to be rejected. And yet, with love, he goes on. So as we approach Holy Week, as we approach the, uh, hopefully what would be for us a, a deeper meditation on, on the Lord's passion, we enter, in, into, we enter into it all, not focusing just on, on, on the Lord's pain, because pain is difficult, but it, it, it happens to a lot of people. You know, you see someone suffering, suffering from, from cancer, long-term uh, illness, it can, be, it can be tragic. So pain is hard. Yes, it's sad. But it's just the incredible love behind all of this. That I will do all of this knowing that some of you will reject me anyway. It's absolutely astounding. The divine love, the love of God for each one of us. So we thank the Lord for his grace, for his forgiveness, for his love, for waiting for us even though we sell him out, we expel him from our little vineyard. We don't listen to him. And yet he continues to knock on our door with humility and with love. Lord Jesus, we welcome you into our hearts. We welcome you in this Holy Eucharist. We welcome you in this spiritual communion. We welcome you in your word. May you come into our hearts, into our lives, and renew the face of the earth.